Trigger Warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. Now, here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. Welcome back to the Preach Boys podcast. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Stephen Clark, a courageous survivor of childhood sexual abuse and his legal team, attorneys Aaron Blank and Guy D'Andrea. Stephen's case has garnered significant attention as it has reached the Maryland Supreme Court, raising critical questions about the constitutionality of the Child Victims Act. In this conversation, Aaron and Guy provide an in-depth explanation of the legal battle they've been fighting on Stephen's behalf. They discussed the recent hearing in Hartford County where they successfully defended the validity of the Child Victims Act against a motion to dismiss by the Board of Education. This law, which extends or eliminates deadlines for survivors to bring claims, is being challenged as unconstitutional. Now, with the Maryland Supreme Court taking up the case, the stakes could not be higher. The court's decision will not only impact Stephen's pursuit of justice, but could also influence the future of many others who have suffered similar trauma. The outcome will determine whether the Child Victims Act stands as a beacon of hope for survivors or if it'll be struck down, closing the door on their opportunity for legal redress. Join us as we delve into the complexities of this case, explore the potential implications of the Supreme Court's ruling, and hear from Stephen himself about his journey and fight for justice. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. I am really excited for today's conversation because I think it is an important one. Um, after hundreds of conversations with various survivors of abuse, there is the trauma of the abuse itself, and there is the trauma that comes with trying to pursue justice and the many roadblocks that come through the legal system, through dealing with law enforcement, and so many, so many things down the road that are not anticipated when that journey begins. And I want to first and foremost kind of set the stage for this conversation. And Guy, maybe you can answer this specific question. Um, Tell me a little bit about the Maryland law that passed that allows survivors to or should allow survivors to pursue lawsuits against those that committed sexual abuse against them as children. Absolutely. And and thank you for having us, Eric. I think I, I agree. This is an incredibly important conversation to have. And to answer your direct question, what Maryland had passed is essentially allowing survivors of childhood sexual abuse to bring a lawsuit against the perpetrator or institutions who failed the children and allowed essentially the abuse to occur for a whole host of reasons, whether it be negligence, you know, negligent supervision, negligent training, negligent hiring, right? Or under circumstances in which they knew of the abuse and did nothing to the abuser, which allowed that abuser to then perpetrate against other children. So Maryland, like so many other states, had recognized that Children who suffer from this type of trauma, and the legislature has done such great work there, that survivors of childhood sexual abuse oftentimes do not come forward until much later in life. In fact, the average survivor who was abused sexually as a child, the age is approximately 55 years old. That's the average age of a childhood sexual assault survivor in terms of when they come forward. And so the law has to keep up with both the medical scientific and the factual circumstances that surround that. And that's exactly what Maryland did by allowing survivors of childhood sexual abuse and trauma to file a lawsuit against those institutions and perpetrators that had allowed the abuse to occur. Yeah. I love that you mentioned it's great work by the legislature to create this opportunity. And like many of these stories on paper, it sounds like a dream come true for many survivors who thought that their window had passed. I'm sure you've had many conversations like I have with people who say, oh, there's no option for me. There's no opportunity to see any kind of justice for this situation. Um, Stephen, for you, as someone who had tried in the past to pursue you know, a criminal case against this, who didn't even have a opportunity to pursue a lawsuit on the table at all, when you became aware of this, what was going through your mind? What were you hoping the process would look like for you? I, I honestly didn't know. 
Um, I think internally, all I've sought is simply justice for the acts committed against me. And I follow the paths that were allowed to me. And that's it. Um, I don't have some idea of what this should look like, but I do think that those that knew, well, let me back up the offenders, those that knew or those that turned a blind eye and did nothing should be held accountable. You know, we're not talking about um, an auto injury. You know, people can get seriously injured in an auto injury, but but if it's, if there's, you have a better chance of recovery from an auto injury. I could break a leg and I'll recover. I can break a arm and I'll recover. It may be traumatic and there may be some therapy in that, but when you're talking about sex, childhood sexual abuse, that's something that's with you forever, never goes away. And there's a host of problems that are caused that, that come out of that, 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 that you deal with. So I didn't know what justice looked like, but I know I wanted it. And so the path at the time that I, I started to pursue this, the civil liabilities weren't even an option to me. It was that my, I timed out through the statute of limitations. So I pursued criminal charges. Um, and, and those doors were closed to me in my opinion, unsatisfactorily. So we never got anything further than, than myself pressing charges. So, so what the end of this looks like, I don't know, but, but the, the short answer is I'm just looking for justice in some fashion. I, I do want to ask this and, and maybe, I mean, Aaron, Guy, Stephen, I, you could probably all add a unique perspective to this question. But one thing that really stuck out to me reading the news article about this story was the way that these cases are talked about is so archaic. The language we use around sexual abuse in the press, in obviously the legal system, is archaic. But then when you add the layer of male victims, the way that these cases are handled is really, really unfortunate for, and that's a pretty gracious word to use. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's atrocious. And it's the reason. I think many male survivors don't come forward is that when a male survivor comes forward in cases of teenage sexual abuse like this, the response is, okay, you had many opportunities to end this. You had many ways to get out of this. You should have handled it this way. And we reject the fact that this is a minor. This is someone that can't consent in the first place. Like there's so many layers to this. There is a big difference between compliance and consent. And without going any further, that that's a big, big difference, and I think that that's where a lot of um, a lot of that 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 thought of that that the boy must enjoy it. Um, you know, he willingly participated. How can boys be raped? Uh, well, it's the same as a female. How can a female be raped? It's the same thing. You know, essentially, it's the same thing. It, are they different perpetrators? Possibly, but um, I, I can't express in enough sincere terms, the level of resistance that I've met. And when this began back when I was a young child, uh, you know, I tried to get, it's not like, it's not like at 10 years old, I didn't say anything. I just put up with it. I mean, you don't know what to do. It's weird. It's, it's all these things and it's, it's so detrimental. But what do you do at 10? You know, you tell the people that you're supposed to tell and they do nothing. They do nothing. You, so who's going to believe you? And eventually what that translates into is that, is that A, as a 10 year old boy, I must have, I must have someone, you internalized this, right? What did I do to deserve this? All I did was go to school and these things are happening to me. And then you start to believe because my parental support was poor. And because you don't have the support at home and you don't have the support at school, you start to believe that if there's an adult that wants to have sex with you in their classroom, that you must do that or you're in trouble for not doing it because no one's believing you. And the reason men don't come forward or a large portion of it, or at least in my case, because you know that nobody's going to believe you because they haven't thus far when you try to do that. And it's not that I did not. I've spent 38 years from the date of the first incident to today has been 38 years. It has literally taken 38 years, multiple conversations with people in positions who should have done something, an act of the state of Congress of Maryland, and all the way up to the Supreme Court to see if somebody's actually going to hear my case. 
What I often see that is very different and starkly, I should say, different when it's a boy versus a girl in, in terms of child sexual abuse, and especially if the perpetrator is a male. So if you have a male perpetrator and a male child uh, who was sexually assaulted, the number one question that I get from defense attorneys and defendants, uh, no matter how young the child is, I'm talking as young as six, seven years old. The question I get when it's a male perpetrator is, well, is your client gay? Right. And it, 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 it blows my mind because I'm like, well, let, let's say that he is. W what is the implication? What is the suggestion? If the child is gay, whether recognized then or later in life, does that mean that a 40 year old male was permitted to, was should be permitted to have sex with the seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 year old? I mean, the question is so insane. You don't, you don't get that question when you have a female child and a male perpetrator, meaning you don't get the, the reverse question. Well, is your client straight? Right. As if the seven year old female can consent somehow magically because she's straight. It's a crazy question. Uh, but what you also see and what we see in Stephen's case, the other perversity of it is the defendants in this case, one of their uh, sort of defenses, right, is that Stephen either assumed the risk and or was contributorily negligent. In other words, despite being sexually assaulted as a young child, he somehow as a child contributed to that. And if he didn't contribute to it, he assumed the risk of it. Meaning you're alone with this adult, you assume the risk of what was going to happen to you. How perverse of a society must we live in if that's what the defendants and their attorneys believe? In other words, that if you as a tr trusting child is in the care of an adult and you're alone with them, then you assume the risk that that adult is going to have sex with you. I mean, th uh, how insane, right? But this is what we see. It's beyond perverse. It's re-traumatizing. I don't even want to call it ignorant because it goes far beyond that, far, far beyond that. And, and that's what you see. Uh, I'm not saying you never see it with a female child. But you see it a lot more often with a male child from a, again, from a legal perspective in terms of the defenses we hear, as well as that first question that I hear oftentimes from defense attorneys and their client. Right, right. And, and that was really the, the thrust of my question was the, the challenge associated with coming forward as a male victim. And, and, and this is, again, this is like an argument of you know, which of these bad options is worse? Because like I said, the language in both cases is archaic. The legal system hasn't caught up in many ways. And even, you know, this is something that Stephen, listening to your story, you're looking at multiple different authority figures that have let you down in extreme ways. And, you know, I, I look oftentimes in these cases where someone will, you know, a judge will take into account in a positive way that, oh, this person was a teacher for this long, or this pastor was in ministry for this many years. They did all of this good. They contributed all this. Let me weigh that into account in sentencing. And I always sit there and go, someone educated in these matters would say, they were willing to do that for 30 years to have access to these people. Like It's such a backwards way of, of looking at these types of cases. And that's why I wanted to ask about the experience of coming forward and dealing with it. And Stephen, I kind of want to ask you, I know you're in the middle of this right now, but going back to elementary school, high school, there's story after story of authority figures that have let you down. Looking back in retrospect, is there part of you that goes, man, if I had known that it was going to be like this, I probably would have never said anything from day one. Like this, this has been a brutal mountain to climb. Wow, that's an understatement. It has been a brutal mountain to climb. Would I have done anything different? No. What What can a ten year old boy do? You know, I, I don't know any ten year old boy that would do anything differently than what I did. I just don't. You're you don't as a ten year old boy have no concept of sex, really. I mean, you know, you kind of understand the birds or bees, kind of. You really don't know what that that is. You don't know the physical sensations. You don't know how they, what feels good, what doesn't. You don't all of those things that you're not supposed to experience until you get further along into your 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 human growth cycle at 13, 14, 15. So, 
I don't know what I could have done differently because of I followed the path that was what you're taught to do. If something happens, you talk, you right. And so, so when you bring that up to the people that are supposed to do something and their attitude is that, well, you must be making that up, right? Like that can't be true. No, this person lights up a room. They're great with kids. How could they possibly do that? And that is all I've heard for 38 years. That's it. But let me tell you, the damage done. And we can get into this later, but the physical trauma that's that's left beyond that, the mental health trauma is there's not enough money in the world to pay for the mental health that's required after something like that happens. And that's on one offender, not even not even multiple offenders. I struggled to finish high school and it was so bad, so bad that I dropped out of school because I couldn't get it to stop. I left my own education because I could not get the offender to leave me alone. It ruined my post-education career. So when you talk about how much money can someone earn in a lifetime, I think an individual that's unmolested, allowed to go through their normal growth cycle, school cycle, that's your, that's your best life. Whatever happens, whatever you do with it, you have your best life in front of you because you've been unmolested in whatever ways to get to that point till you're an adult and you're fully formed and can make all your own cognizant decisions. Someone that has had that stolen from them at the age of 10 has no idea what had been stolen from them. Their, their self, their being, that person has been murdered. Then you escalate that to a second offender. So on and on and on, you're compounding this. And yet, where are the people that know? Where are the people that are supposed to be doing something? How do you let offenders in your school system just stay there? How do you move them around? Wait. So my life is my second best life. I'll never get back my best life. That was taken from me at 10 years old. It was stolen from me. I had the people in the correct position stepped in. There might have been a chance that that could have been mitigated some. But they failed to do that. And the fact that not even that they failed to do it, they already didn't do it. So whatever life I have today is has been a struggle to get here to this point. And this is my best life. So, yeah. You know, I don't think it's any easier on a female, but I think there's more supportive systems out there for a female. I think when the burden is that you don't have to prove your validity, like something happened to me. I don't have to validate that to everybody. People believe that. That goes a long way with that victim. But when people don't believe that and you have to continually validate it, or people just don't want to hear it anymore because it makes them uncomfortable, where do you go? What are you supposed to do? When you mention, you know, people not wanting to hear it because it makes them uncomfortable, or they don't want to accept the fact that it was abuse because the thought of that makes them uncomfortable. It really puts a lot of shame on you the victim, you know, when in these situations, like you said, the shame should be on the people who knew about it and didn't do anything, the person who obviously committed the offense, but yet the shame rests on your shoulders. And so before you can even fight for justice, you have to fight to be heard and believed, which is a, you know, the way you just described everything is, is a really tragic, but true thing. Um, I have a friend of mine and she talks about, uh, sexual abuse that, it creates a lifetime sentence for the victim. It it's it's a it's a life sentence, and there's no amount of time, no amount of money, you know, that's ever going to make up for what you just described. It's the unknown. It's like what could my life have been had things played out in a a quote unquote normal way. Sure, this isn't one of those cases where oh man, what if I'd have gone to this school instead of that school, or what if I would have married this person? That's that's not even what this is about. Missed opportunities. What I'm talking about is what was robbed from me, what was stolen from me, what was raped from me. It, you can't get that back. And the victim, you know, at ten years old, I couldn't articulate this, and, and it took me it's well into adulthood to finally get myself into trauma therapy to be able to sort of really makes sense of a lot of these things. You know, at 10, why is my teacher wanting to have sex with me? What is that about? That is so foreign. I can't, you know, I've raised children and I couldn't imagine having a child like if today that happened to one of my children. I couldn't even imagine that. But, but, you know, here we are. The offenders have gotten to go on with their lives. 
they've gotten to have their careers. They've gotten to retire. They've gotten their benefits. They, they, they've gotten everything. And I'll say this. There's, my high school offender was a known offender. And what I mean by that is sexual abuse does not happen in a vacuum, not in public institutions and not in churches. Someone, people always see it. There's always red flags, 100% red flags. So people knew this, this isn't a shock. And if my case were to be much more public in that hometown, the people that I went to school with, I believe if you were to go and ask my classmates, I think any one of them would say, yeah, that individual was weird. They did weird things. They did, you know, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. And if children are seeing it, adults are seeing it. The adults are the ones who are turning their heads. Those are the, those are the enablers. And then to have to come go wear that burden on my life and, and, and I miss out on career opportunities. I missed out on, on, Hell, I didn't graduate high school because of this nonsense. To miss out on college, I, I can't get any of that back. Is there a material value to that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Because it it financially ruined me through mental health and all these other things. And and I, I did that path with other people though. I, I tried the alcohol and the all of that stuff, the destructive behaviors. And at the end of the day, there was nothing that was going to work. So I put myself into trauma therapy. And when I began to deal with this, what it did for me was give me back a sense of life that I had not known before that was taken from me. Now, again, that's not the same life. That's not your best life. This, this is the best that I've got right now. And so I started to follow those paths, you know, criminal charges and all of that. And that's kind of where we, we are today. So where are we today? I know people can read and, and, you know, the, the legal system is a, uh, it's a chaotic system to someone who doesn't know it. And, um, you know, right now it seems like there's a real struggle to even get this case heard. So where do we sit right now, Aaron, if you can kind of give some context as to where the case currently sits, what this could mean for other cases like it in the state of Maryland and even nationally, depending on where this case goes. Um, where is it, where's it sitting right now? Sure. So <clears throat> a little over two months ago, a uh, guy and I appeared in the circuit court in Harford County for a hearing, uh, on a motion to dismiss filed by the board of education. And, uh, during that hearing, the board raised a challenge to the trial judge claiming that the, the new child victims act, uh, that went into effect last year was unconstitutional under Maryland law. Um, they basically argued that this law extending or eliminating the deadlines uh, for survivors to bring claims, that that elimination uh, violated constitutional rights held by the board and other, other litigants out there who, who are now being sued for these cases. Um, we won that hearing um, in the sense that the judge denied their motion. The judge agreed with our position that the New Child Victims Act does not violate um, constitutional rights. It is a, a legal law, for, for lack of a better description, but the, the law is valid. And, and therefore, Stephen's case shall proceed. Within the Child Victims Act, our legislature recognized that there would be legal challenges on this basis. And what they did, I think wisely, was the, they created... An, an appellate shortcut, meaning that Stevens' case and, and other people who are bringing these cases don't have to go all the way through the process of the lawsuit, have a trial, have, have a result, and then at that point, uh, parties can now appeal the cases. What the legislature did was they added a shortcut that said, if there's a motion to dismiss that's filed, challenging the constitutionality of the law, and it's denied, then, then that party can have a, what we call an interlocutory appeal or, or an early appeal rather than waiting for the entire lawsuit to go forward. So the, the ruling on the denial of the motion to dismiss in our case was denied uh, back in March. And then from there, the Board of Education filed their appeal 
uh, to, the, to the Maryland Appellate Court, which is the Intermediate Appellate Court. From there, the Board of Education uh, filed what's called a petition for cert to the Maryland Supreme Court, which is the highest appellate court. So typically what happens is in a, in a, normal, in a normal lawsuit, just any commercial matter or, or, or any other civil matter, you have the trial level following the result. One of the parties may appeal it to the, the, the intermediate appellate court. And then if they believe there was an error made on that appeal, they can appeal to the Supreme Court, which would be the highest appellate court. Now, in this case, the Board of Education filed this petition for certification to go straight, uh, straight to the Supreme Court, all the way to the top. And, and the Supreme Court can accept cases for cert when there's a, an issue of new law that has never been decided before. And just recently, just this past week, we received a response from the Supreme Court accepting that certification. So just within the past week, the Supreme Court has certified uh, two very specific questions. Um, mostly, the big one is whether or not the Child Victims Act is constitutional or not. So we've received a, a, a schedule from the court, and, and now the Board of Education will file a brief on this issue to the Supreme Court. We'll file a response. And then I believe in September, we have a hearing set where we will go and, and argue this. And to get to the, the second part of your question is, well, what, how will this case have effect on other cases? If the Supreme Court agrees with us and rules that the Child Victim Act is constitutional, as it's written, then other survivors who have, have brought lawsuits currently um, and other survivors in the future that may wish to bring lawsuits, uh, their cases will be allowed to proceed. If the Supreme Court rules that the law is unconstitutional, either in whole or in part, it will knock out an avenue for justice for a lot of people. So uh, there really is a lot riding on this. Um, obviously, for for Stephen, um, who we obviously you know care dearly about as our client, uh, but we also recognize that there is a, a broader ecosystem of justice that that will largely depend on, on what happens in Stephen's case. One of the things that's really concerning to me is that the Board of Education is fighting so vehemently against a survivor coming forward and, again, fighting against a survivor in a way that could have a precedence that affects hundreds, thousands, an unknown amount of survivors from that point on. Why do you feel the Board of Education is putting itself in this position when you would think their primary focus would be protecting children and students, both past, present, and future. Defendants, generally speaking, and I don't want to know, I don't know the specifics of this board of education, but everything I've seen across this country, I practice nationally, is defendants fight tooth and nail on these cases. I mean, adamantly beyond anything you'll see in almost any other type of litigation. I think the only thing close that I've seen is in medical malpractice cases with doctors fighting so vehemently. They care about, at the end of the day, money. That's it, right? They, defendants in this space, have chosen for so long to do the wrong thing, and it's only when they're held accountable and losing money do they start doing the right thing. And so they couch it in all sorts of different ways, and I'm talking generally about defendants who have allowed the perpetrating of, of abuse against children, um, oftentimes they'll say, well, wait a second. If a child was sexually assaulted and so harmed, how is it fair that he or she gets to wait 30, 40, 50 years to bring this lawsuit? Or some of them even say, how is it fair that they get to bring it after two years, right? And, and it is such a fundamental misunderstanding of what a childhood sexual assault survivor goes through and I have tried so many different ways to get people. I'm talking even people I know who aren't in the legal space to understand, guy, tell me why this is fair. And so one of the exercises I do oftentimes, and I've done it with law students and I've done it with friends, is especially in a law school setting, I'll say, I'm going to, they don't know what the class is about. And I'll say, we're, we're talking about witness testimony and why people recant or don't come forward, right? If that's the topic in the class. I'll say, I'm going to randomly, before we start the class, I want to do a little exercise and I'm going to randomly call on someone. And when I call on you, what I want you to do is I want you to tell the whole class, you're going to come up to the front and you're going to stand before the whole class and you're going to describe your last consensual 
sexual adult encounter. And I want you to tell us every, I mean, every detail, who did what to whom, how you enjoyed it, what you were thinking, what you were experiencing, you know, have you talked to the person? I want every detail. The look of horror on these individuals' faces is, 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 it's, it's, if you could almost see them, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And this is true with anyone you ask this question of. It is that you could see the pit in their stomach. You could see the look of like, if he actually does this, I'm going to run out of this room and go right to HR, right? And, and so it, obviously I don't make someone do that, but I let them sit with it for a few minutes. And I mean, you, you, some people look like they're going to throw up. And I said, let me ask you something. Here's what I'm struggling with. I was going to ask a group of adults to come up here and talk about an adult consensual, ideally you would think if you consented, you know, enjoyable experience and you all look like you were about to throw up. So how do you think someone who was raped as a child, especially still at a childhood age, would feel having to testify in front of judges they've never met, 12 strangers in a jury, an attorney general or a prosecutor, several detectives, multiple defense attorneys, in front of the abuser, by the way, right? You weren't willing to come up here and talk about a good experience. So how do you think a child would feel, no matter what age they were, telling dozens of strangers when, when it's all said and done, what happened to them, right? And so why is it fair? That's why it's fair, right? People need to, whenever they're ready, if they ever are ready, the time, both for, and this is not just from me as an attorney saying this, this is what the medical professionals, the best in the business say, right? They, survivors need the time that they need, if ever, to come forward. And Marilyn got it right. And all we can do is truly hope that the Maryland Supreme Court and, and all of the opinions in the past, I, 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 I hope, that's all we can do at this point, is hope that they look back at the laws that they've already created and the intent of the legislature, because what this is doing is protecting individuals who were abused as children. And how dare, dare organizations at the end of the day give so much pushback on survivors being able to recover for the wrongs that they did or allowed to happen under their watch. What he's saying is that the defendants are saying, well, how can you bring these? The side that I don't hear talked about enough is, well, what about the victims? We don't get rid of the abuse. We don't, all that that comes with it, that doesn't go away. That's a lifetime sentence. So to hear what he's, how he's describing the defendants is accurate, but that argument is so fallacious and moot, it's not even funny because they're the ones who cause the damage. The victim doesn't get rid of any of that. It's with no. us for life. If, right. if I can give a, uh, a, a metaphor I like to use, just to, you know, going back to the original question about why these things or why, why lawsuits in general may be defended so vigorously, think of it as a dam, right? And there's all this water rushing up and the dam's about to blow. And you know, for in, in this, you know, particular case, in, in the cases of, of child sexual abuse, you know, it, it's, it's not just Maryland that has, has gotten up to date on this. There's a, a growing national consciousness, you know, a moral consciousness, a societal understanding, you know, mental health understanding, all these reasons, you know, before we get to civil justice, right? There, there's all these societal reasons. And, and I think the parties that are defending these cases they know the dam is about to blow and, and they see these laws coming down the line. And I think they're preparing to defend them before the laws are even, even passed. And before the laws even passed, I think, I think there's lobbying, or I, I should say, I know there's lobbying efforts to, to thwart, you know, to thwart this, you know, whether those interests come from corporations, insurance companies, municipalities, who, where, wherever they, you know, pharmaceutical industries, you know, medical industries, hospital industries, wherever they come from, auto insurance industries, wherever they come from, they're, they're trying to, to keep the dam, right? So they can guard the king's gold. And as Guy said, you know, they come up with these arguments. They're really just abstractions, right? They're, they don't really, I, I don't know if they really mean what they say. I mean, that's a whole different level of, of uh, evil in my opinion, but I think they just, they, they abstract these things. They raise any sort of kind of technicalities they can to, to, to thwart, you know, what's, what's right, what's just in, in, in reality. They use these legal fictions and um, they'll just fight to guard the dam because they know once it blows, you know, that's a, big, that's a big red mark in their balance sheet at the end of the year. Yeah. And this is ancillary, but, but 
what's also happening, I'm reading some articles lately about this, and particularly in the in the Catholic diocese in Baltimore, is because they entered bankruptcy prematurely before the law has been um, invalidated or validated by the Supreme Court. They are having to sue their insurance provider who said, we don't want you in bankruptcy. We want the law rolled on first. We're not going to pay out anything. We're not covering damages. So they're actually having to battle their insurance companies. So it, to, to these gentlemen's point, it's not just the victims or, or the plaintiff's attorneys that are seeing this. The insurance companies see it. They're saying, why are we on the hook when you are the ones causing the damage? We're, we, we insure accidents. We don't insure. Right. So my point is, I'm not. I'm not advocating for insurance companies. What I'm saying is even the insurance companies see it. If they're not willing to cover the damages done, that means they understand how wrong it is what's happening. Otherwise, they would cover this and try and make sure everything flowed smoother. So I don't know. I, I agree with them. I think we're an important so- at a point in society where this archaic argument about boys enjoyed it or you willingly participated It's sad that it's even there. It's archaic and it makes the people saying it look foolish. Foolish. And I don't think they realize how foolish they look when they're trying to put this argument up front. And I attended the hearing um, that that both of these gentlemen argued on March 19th. And it was very satisfactory to me to see the judge in that case make the defendants stand up and, and argue that point. Do you think that this individual really liked this? And their response was, well, we're not saying that about his elementary school teacher. So, so in one offender, they think I deserved it and I participated on the other one. They're saying, no, not that one. That one, that one he didn't deserve. I don't know what they're thinking, but, but they split the difference when the judge asked them. I know right now we're in a spot where there's a lot just waiting to happen. And, you know, Aaron, to uh, continue your metaphor, uh, I'm someone hoping that dams continue bursting all over the country in cases like this. Um, I, you know, I, I think we are at a point now where, you know, uh, the education is there, like the opportunity to know that the statistics are easy to find. You know, I, I'm always saying like, I'm a almost 30 year old podcaster who has read a lot of books. I've, I've talked to a lot of people and it's some of the earliest things that you read about is the time it takes for people to come forward. The, um, the reasons that people, you know, don't report abuse, the ways that predators operate, like the information is accessible to someone like myself and as someone like anyone who listens to the show can go find that with a qu- couple quick searches. And so it's also accessible to judges, to lawyers, to, you know, way down the line, teachers, boards of education, clergy, the information's there. And now we need to take that information and make the right decision on the behalf of the victims. And um, I know we're in this waiting period. I'm, I'm curious, just as my final question, for those of us who are listening to this and we hear about these cases and we get frustrated and angry and we go, the system feels broken and we want to push for the dams to break, but it feels like they won't. Is there anything that the individual listening can do to help support causes like this, to help support cases like this really being heard at the levels they need to be heard so that change can happen moving forward. Because, you know, as a parent myself, and I know Stephen, you mentioned being a parent, the thought of these things happening to future generations makes me sick to my stomach. How do we kind of change the tide here moving forward? You have to have in states in which the laws are archaic, uh, you know, there are states that you have two years to bring the lawsuit, w- w- even when you're not, not after you turned 18, when you're still a child. So it's a wait a second, wait. So the nine year old by 11 years old is supposed to know, oh, I can call this attorney, right? I mean, it's ridiculous. You have to petition, you have to write letters, you have to, to, to go to your state reps, your state senators, to the, on the United States level, right? To, to our, Congress, you have to let them know this is an issue you care about. And anyone who's a parent, this should be an issue you care about. Uh, You know, it's not a topic that anybody ever wants to discuss because everybody wants to believe it doesn't happen to them or their family. But sadly, it happens not in every uh, state. It happens in every town, right? Every town. And, And changing policies and procedures and safety 
that should be in place that to me is common sense, but sadly, so many organizations aren't following it. Uh, as simple as no one child should ever be alone with one adult that you're not, you don't know, right? I mean, I don't care if you're a teacher, right? A teacher should never be in a closed room without windows or door, right? With a child. And, and it's just to me common sense, right? There are so many things, there are so many resources for organizations who have not maybe experienced or have been trying to do the right thing that they could reach out to, to make sure that their policies and procedures are there to protect the safety of children, because that's what the responsibility is for these organizations who take in children. And if you can't ensure a child's safety, then do a different business, period, end of story. I'm sick of the, we don't have the resources to have two staff members for every child then don't be a daycare center, right? I mean, go do, no one, no one put a, I've never heard of someone going to someone and saying with a gun to their head, you have to open a daycare center. No, you don't, right? Like if you're choosing to do that, you need to do it right and you need to do it in a way that damn near ensures every child's safety. Well, thank you, um, Guy and Aaron, for the legal fight that you're putting into, onto this and, and for all the work that you're doing. I know there's so much more to do. Um, and thank you, Stephen, for for sharing your story. I know there's so much that can't be shared yet, so much that I know you'd love to share and and so much that needs to be shared um, once the legal side of this is completed. Um, but I, I really appreciate you doing this and and I applaud your bravery and your strength. I, I can't imagine um, you know, the process of feeling again betrayed by these institutions from elementary school to high school to now, you know. 30 plus years later now dealing with this on a, you know, a level of, you know, the legal side and the legal battle. So um, I hope for anybody listening that's, that's hearing this, that they'll keep track of this story and that they'll pursue in their own areas, like you said, in, in their own towns, in their own cities, in their own states, uh, you know, pursue supporting any kind of legislation that's going to help <laughs> change the tide on these cases, but also support individual survivors and victims who are battling this. Like I know that's half of it. Having people that believe you is is so so important. But um thank you so much for sharing. I really hope that we'll have another uh, conversation soon kind of giving an update on this. Uh you know, once everything has gone through the Supreme Court. Um but yeah, for now, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, Please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc.